this is highly relevant to uh, acute kidney injury and, and the topics we're discussing, uh, as you will see. The relief trial is uh, a major undertaking which uh, was recently released by the New England Journal of Medicine and uh, it published on the 9th of May. And uh, those that want to hear more about it, there's a podcast which can be uh, accessed. It was an undertaking which was uh, under the um, aegis of the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care uh, Society, the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists, and was in collaboration with uh, a variety of bodies and investigators in uh, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, as you will see, Hong Kong, Ireland, and also uh, in Italy. This is the geographic distribution of centers that participated in this trial, which is the largest trial of post-operative and intraoperative care ever conducted in 47 hospitals and in Canada, United States, UK, Italy, Hong Kong, Australia, and uh, New Zealand. That's a list of centers um, and patients randomized. The background to this trial is that uh, the typical routine management of patients who develop postoperative hypotension is to give a bolus of intravenous fluids. And as a consequence of that, and as a consequence of maintenance fluid therapy, which is given uh, during and before and immediately after surgery, on the day of surgery, typically res patients receive around six liters of intravenous fluids, and then other fluids are given after that. So typically, the post-operative period in patients having major surgery is associated with a significant weight gain and a significant positive fluid balance. Many people have challenged that as potentially undesirable, and they've suggested that a more restrictive fluid regime would be uh, a better approach uh, in the care of these patients. There will be less pulmonary edema, potentially less hemodilution, and thereby fewer acts of transfusion. And this would be potentially helpful for patients. And of course, the fluid accumulation itself might decrease tissue edema, and in people having abdominal surgery, it might decrease gut edema, and the decrease in gut edema may in turn decrease the risk of anastomotic uh, um, injury and anastomotic dehiscence, and thereby decrease the number of post-operative complications. On the other hand, people have argued that if you run these patients with less intravenous fluid administration, you will deliver more hypotension. And if there is more hypotension, more vasopressor drugs will be used. Uh, potentially more ICU admissions will take place. And more of these drugs will induce vasoconstriction, both of the wound and vasoconstriction of the renal circulation and vasoconstriction of the anastomosis, which in turn would also uh, provoke a greater risk of an astomotic breakdown. So which one? Which one is the best option for our patients? Recently, there's been a lot of uh, kind of argument that the best option is to deliver restrictive fluid therapy. There have been uh, studies that have been small, but nonetheless, they've supported the view that a restrictive approach will decrease surgical complications. One of them, is a small study of patients having uh, colonic surgery reporting in a very small cohort of patients that decrease in complications. Uh, the biggest one is by uh, Brigitte uh, Brandstrup. Uh, it's widely quoted and it's a regimen that compared a restrictive fluid regimen to a more liberal fluid regimen and again in colorectal patients found a significant decrease in complications and even a trend towards decreased mortality. More recently, in 2005, 152 patients were randomized to a restrictive versus a more liberal approach. And again, those treated with a restrictive approach had less complications. This has led 
to a variety of guidelines and statements uh, by a variety of societies, uh, the American Society for Enhanced Recovery, uh, the British uh, guideline bodies, Scandinavian societies, and, and this has then led to the development of the so-called ERAS, uh, Early Recovery After Surgery, approach to the management of these patients. And the prevalent view that, in fact, maintaining patients in a near zero fluid balance in the perioperative period will decrease complications and reduce length of stay in hospital. However, all of these studies are small. All of them, by their very nature, are not blinded. And therefore, they're uh, open to bias, open to type 1 error, and need to be verified or confirmed or maybe refuted in a large, multicenter, robust, randomized control trial. And this is what the relief trial is. It's a trial that aimed to test the hypothesis that a restricted fluid regimen in adult patients undergoing major abdominal or pelvic surgery would lead to reduced complications and, importantly, improve disability-free survival compared to a liberal fluid regimen. This is an international study, as I said to you, and the goal was to deliver in the first 24 hours a conventional liberal fluid regimen of about 5 to 6 liters versus a more restrictive <coughs> regimen of 2 to 3 liters in the first 24 hours. So, what do these approaches look like? If you're going into the restricted arm at induction of surgery, you receive a smaller amount of fluid, 5 mils per kilogram. So, for the average patient, this would be about 400 mils of intravenous fluid at induction. During surgery, maintenance fluid would be uh, 5 mils per kilogram per hour. And then after surgery, the intravenous fluids will be less than 0.8 mils per kilogram per hour. On the other side, in the liberal or more conventional traditional group, 10 mils per kilo at induction. During surgery, 8 mils per kilo. And then after surgery, 1.5 mils per kilo per hour. So about 125, 120 mils per kilogram per hour. In both groups, of course, if there is blood loss, then it should be replaced uh, either with blood or colloidal fluid as may be necessary. And modification, of course, can be made by the clinician if there is a concern about the patient's condition uh, and fluid is deemed to be necessary. And the idea is to deliver about three liters in the patient's randomized to restrictive management and about 5.4 liters in the patients randomized to liberal treatment. All the other aspects of the patient's care should be unchanged. This is the only thing that's being changed. And additional fluid can be given, of course, if clinically indicated. And of course, there is encouragement for these patients to be managed according to the ERAS principle of multimodal analgesia, early feeding, early ambulation, and early discharge planning. The primary endpoint of the trial was a patient focus, a patient centered outcome, which is that of disability free survival after surgery at one year. This is measured by the HUDAS. Um, measurement of disability, which is the World Health Organization developed and validated criterion, which has a great degree of robustness. Of course, we looked at other relevant secondary endpoints, acute kidney injury, major septic complications, both together as a total, and each one of them, including sepsis, surgical site infection, anastomotic leak, pneumonia, and also, of course, mortality of 30, 90 days in a year, unplanned admission to ICU, some quality of recovery data, and ICU and hospital stay. 
the idea is to try and establish the optimal fluid loading position in post-operative patients in order to achieve optimal outcomes. Now, first of all, when you do a trial like this, you want to know if you've been able to achieve adequate separation as you planned in the amount of fluid that the patients received. And you can see there in terms of intraoperative fluid administration and the total fluids administered in the first 24 hours, we did pretty well. There was a clear separation and the separation in terms of quantity was similar to what we hoped to achieve. In one group, this resulted in a fluid balance, which was positive about 3 liters. In the other, about 1.4 liters. In one group, the weight gain was about 1.6 kilograms. And in the other group, it was very close to neutral, as we hoped to achieve. What kind of operations did we do? As you can see, the two major groups of operations were colorectal surgery and esophageal and gastric surgery. The rest were a mix of urological and gynecological surgery. Uh, about half of the operations were laparoscopic, uh, were open, and about a, th a third were laparoscopic in nature, with the rest being combined laparoscopic and open surgery. The average duration of these operations was about 3.3 uh, hours, and it was identical in the two groups. One of the things that you always want to know when you do large randomized controlled trials is that the patients you randomize were balanced. You don't think anything is going to happen because it's such a large trial and there is web-based randomization, but nonetheless, it's comforting to demonstrate that on all uh, measures, body weight, uh, ASA, physical status, country, medical condition, uh, preoperative investigation, post-operative care, and type of surgical events, uh, there was absolutely a uh, balance between the two groups. So I'm now going to present you the primary outcome, which is the disability-free survival at one year from randomization. Between the two groups, there was uh, no difference in disability-free survival, which was around 80%, which tells you that of these patients, 20% have a high disability or mortality at one year. And this is the Kaplan-Meier uh, curve presenting this result in a graphic format showing the equivalence of the two interventions in relation to the primary outcome. Now I'm going to present the major secondary outcomes. The secondary outcome of acute kidney injury was significantly different between the patients randomized to restrictive versus liberal fluid management, such that the relative risk of developing acute kidney injury was approximately 70% greater in the patients randomized to a restrictive fluid management. In relation to the septic outcome or death, there was no difference between the two groups. However, there was a difference between the two groups for surgical site infection with an approximate 20% increase in surgical site infection for the restrictive fluid management group. There was also a difference in the need for renal replacement therapy with a point estimate of a three-fold increase in the patients randomized to restrictive management. There was also a slight difference in quality of life, as you will see there, in favor of restrictive therapy, but this is quite minor. And you can see there that the mortality at 90 days was favoring, in terms of direction, uh, the patients treated in the liberal group as opposed to the restrictive strategy. 
when you see these results, it's always helpful to try and understand a little bit more uh, what mechanisms might have been at play in inducing these differences and the robustness of these differences across other measures of kidney function. As you will see there, there was a difference in the lowest systolic blood pressure in favor of the liberal group, and there was a difference in the recovery room in favor of the liberal group, so more hypotension in the restricted group. There was also a significant difference in urinary output in favor of the liberal group. There was a greater incidence of oliguria or anuria in the first 24 hours against the restricted group. And as I said, the acute kidney injury was clearly different, as was the renal replacement therapy. A reasonable question at this point is whether the acute kidney injury that was seen in excess in the restricted group was due to stage one only, so a mild type of condition that may not be as clinically important. And the answer is no. As you can see there, in the uh, restrictive group, there was an increase in stage one, stage two, stage three, all combined, even with or without adjustment for fluid balance. It doesn't get much stronger than that for a signal in a randomized control trial. Now, when we said there was a surgical site infection, we subdivided this into superficial wound infection in the incision, deep wound infection of the incision, or organ space, for example, anastomotic or intra-abdominal infection. And you can see that all of the signal is for intra-abdominal or organ space infection in favor of a liberal management strategy. Then we looked at these signals in a forest plot for all the different subgroups. And you can see there that the disability-free survival was similar across all groups. But there is a signal that we currently cannot explain for an increased risk of disability-free survival uh, for uh, the restrictive fluid, in that the liberal fluid was better in New Zealand. And we have no understanding of this, and we're currently trying to investigate why this difference happened. And there is clearly also a significant difference of interaction. Now, there is also an interaction between sex, and in that the female cohort appeared to have a worse effect from a restrictive therapy. And again, this is going to be the subject of further investigation. You can see the p-values for interaction between the variable and the outcome for these two specific conditions. And uh, this will be the subject of further analysis. Now, when looking at patients that were managed with a goal-directed therapy device, where there was monitoring of cardiac output by invasive means to see if there was a difference in that particular group of people, we did not find any difference. What about acute kidney injury? Were there any differences across all of these subgroups of patients? And the answer is no. You can see they're all on the side uh, where liberal fluid management is better in all of the subgroups that we have looked at and there is no interaction between the subgroups and this. We also obtain data on people's adherence to the ERAS principles to ascertain if any of these principles were violated, whether it affected disability-free survival. And as you can see there, for all of those principles, whether they were adhered to or not, you can see that there is no difference for disability through survival. We then looked for the types of surgery and these principles in relation to bowel preparation, fasting times, insertion of a nasogastric tube, use of neuroaxial block, 
the surgical approach, the number of ERAS items that the clinicians adhere to, and again, it doesn't get much clearer than this. There is a benefit from liberal management in terms of acute kidney injury for all of these groups. So in patients undergoing major abdominal surgery, a restrictive intravenous fluid regimen, which was designed to achieve zero balance in the first 24 hours, did not benefit the patients, did not reduce complications, did not uh, decrease length of stay. On the contrary, the restrictive fluid approach was associated with a higher risk of acute kidney injury and a higher risk of renal replacement therapy and a higher risk of surgical site infection, particularly in the abdominal space. When we use the fluid responsive monitor to optimize the management of the patient, there was no modification of this effect. When we looked at adherence to the ERAS principles, there was no modification of these effects. Now, until now, surgical management uh, types for intravenous fluids for abdominal surgery have been classified into restrictive, restrictive, balanced, or liberal. Our management falls into the restrictive category on one side and into the liberal on the other sides. Current recommendations in the literature in the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery program suggest and recommend that we should avoid a greater than 2.5 weight gain during the surgery. Our findings do not support that. They should not, however, be used to support excessive intravenous fluid administration. We have simply shown that compared to a restrictive regimen, a regimen that has a modestly liberal fluid approach, which delivers in the first 24 hours somewhere around 6 liters of intravenous fluid, is superior to a regimen that aims to achieve zero balance. So as a consequence of the findings of the relief study, we believe that we should recommend a moderately liberal intravenous fluid regimen for major abdominal surgery, which delivers approximately 10 mils per kilogram at induction, continues to deliver a relatively liberal treatment during the operation, and more fluid if clinically indicated, and after fluid, an infusion of 1.5 mils per kilogram per hour and more if clinically indicated. Thank you very much for your attention.